Hey guys, in this video I'll show you how to make a full multiplayer trivia game. The language that I have chosen is JavaScript, but that doesn't really matter that much, as you might choose any language and engines and the steps will be fairly similar to each other. Before we start with making the game, first we have to know what we want it to be. There are a lot of trivia games, but the one that we're making is very similar to a game called Trivia Door. In short, this is a 3 player game where you conquer different tiles of land by answering questions. Also, you can attack any of the opponents to take their land and like that you gain even more points. Let's start with making our assets that we are going to need for the game. For the map I found a very nice pack from each.io, link in the description, and from the assets in it I constructed the map. It's nothing special, but it works perfectly in our case. The main part of the map will be to have different sections, which will be our land that we will fight and conquer. Now let's make different colors for every player that we're going to have, which in my case are going to be red, green and blue. We want to extract every segment into different pieces, with the different colors so it's easier for us to work with. When we do all that, we need to use a texture packer to combine the different parts of the segments together. This way, instead of us having 4 images for every separate section of the map, we're going to have only one image. For this purpose, I'm going to be using a program called Free Texture Packer. As you can guess, it's free and does the job perfectly. Just drag all the parts you want into it. In my case, every segment has 4 parts, the normal tile and 3 others for the different player colors. I'm naming them based on the sections we have them from, plus the color. This is important part of the process, because we want to make things as easier as we can for later on. The Atmos file will contain all the segments combined with their location and size. Now to start with our game development, let's set up the project. We are going to be using React and also a multiplayer library called Your Turn. And your turn actually provides us with a very easy way to set up the project. Just open the folder you want your project to be in and install the package. Then you have a choice to pick between given templates for the setup. So let's choose the React one and click Enter. After everything is installed, we can see that we have our project. In short, we have a source folder for our backend server part and frontend folder for the client side of the game. We are going to check the multiplayer part later into the video, but currently what we are interested in is the frontend part. Let's place all our assets in a public folder. Not only the segmented parts of the map, but also we need to split our map into different parts. It really depends on what your map looks like, but in my case I have two different files, which are the full map without the walls in one image and the walls on another. Also, I have created three peons for our players in another texture. To make the game elements, because we are going to be working with JavaScript, there is a very nice game engine called Pixie.js. Open the frontend folder from the terminal and install the package. I'm going to be using version 6.5 just because I had some issues with the setup of the 7 plus version. So just keep in mind if you're choosing a different one, there might be some differences, but it will be almost the same. The main function containing our game I'm going to call app. Inside it, let's start by importing Pixie.js and create a canvas element that will contain our game. To access it, we make a reference, then initialize Pixie by creating new application and set our view parameter to be the canvas we just created. Also, we set some width and height for the game. Then let's preload all the assets that we have because we don't want to randomly load them while playing the game. We do this by making an array containing all of them. Then we loop through them and say game loader add. Also we add cross origins just in case so we don't have issues when loading them later on. To know when they're loaded, we have two events provided. One is on progress to watch the progress and load when everything finished loading. Let's use this data in React by creating states for them where we will hold progress value and if everything is loaded. Currently what we have is the full map without the walls in one image, the walls with the tile separation on another image and all of the tiles on a separate texture. In order to combine them, we first need to access them. This is done by simply getting them from the resources map being returned from the load event. Then we create a sprite, which now we can use in game. You can think of sprites as images that we can manipulate in all sorts of ways without changing the original source. To place them in our scene, just type add child and our sprite. I'm only doing this for the map, 
because we are not going to be changing anything on it at any point. For the other components, what I like using is something called container. So instead of us putting the sprites directly in our game object, we can create a container and put it inside. This helps us if we want to manipulate everything in specific container at the same time. For example, if we move it, everything inside it will move as well. If we're adding a tile without it, we need to calculate the X and Y positions for every single tile on our canvas. Now let's add another container for our tiles. As you can guess, every single tile we have in our texture pack is going to be inside it. To know what the position of the map we should put them, we can go to the software we made the map and check the properties of the element. But there is one problem here. We're going to be having a lot of tiles and potentially multiple maps in the future as well. This means we need to automate some bits of the code. So instead of us putting all the tile sprites by hand, let's just create a list of objects that will contain the information for every tile. We're not only including the positions, but also the tile type, which is if the tile should be empty, blue, green, red, depending on which player has taken the tile. Also, we have the tile click, which will trigger every time we click the tile. This is important because we are detecting the event with Pixie.js, but we also want to pass it to React. Now inside the constructor, we can set the initializing properties of our tiles. I am also subtracting the board container position, because as we said, we need to calculate the tile position, as if it was from the start of the canvas and not the start of the container. Next, with the tile position, we're going to be getting our texture atlas. From it, we can get which type of tile color we want based on the tile type we're passing. Now that we have our setup, we can jump into the logic of the game. Right from the start, we know for almost any game that we need a login screen and a lobby screen. For the login, because it's our first screen, we would like to have progress bar to see if our game images have loaded before we actually show the login. So we pass our progress state that we got earlier and show login which tells us when all the images have loaded and we're ready to display the content. And of course a click event for the actual login part. Also let's make a state that will hold our username that our player will play with. This will be our only login requirement. Just so you know, I'm also using Tailwind, it's just easier to work with. And that's it, but you can choose whatever you want. Based on the show login variable, we decide which part we should show, the progress or the login. Here is the result. As we see, our progress was very fast, and after it finished, it showed us the login. Now that we have the client side of the login, let's check how we should use it with our multiplayer part of the project. In our source folder, open main.js, which was previously generated by your turn library. What we have by default are four functions. On room start, which is going to be triggered every time we create our game, this is perfect for initializing anything you want for your game. On player join, when a player joins, on player quit, when a player leaves, and on player move, is going to be our main communication for anything we have in our game. A login, a lobby, moves, whatever you can think of. The way the multiplayer part works is that we have a state that we're returning at all times. So anytime something happens, we're going to be returning the updated state. To make things more clear, let's look how we can handle our login screen. Because everything is going through on player move, we need to have a way to distinguish what part of the game is running currently. We know that every time the game is created, means every player should go through the login and lobby first before entering the game. That's why in our game we are going to keep the status of what point of the game we're on. So when the game is created by default, the first thing should be the game preparation. And in our on player move, we're going to be checking for that status and execute the different parts of the game. We also have player state object that will hold everything for the specific player. And inside we also have a status. This is necessary because every player can be at different stages of the game. One can be on the login screen and the other can be waiting in the lobby. And then on login move we are setting in our player state, the username that we have provided in the input field, and right after that we are changing the status to lobby because our player has finished the login process. This means if we leave and enter the game right now, it will send us to the lobby and not the login screen. We can retrieve any variable we pass to our multiplayer from our move parameter. All this is triggered from the front end by saying client.makeMove 
and passing the username parameter. The most important part is to work with the state, because that's what notifies all the players in the game. If we do anything that does not change the state, that means only our player will see that locally. That's why every time we trigger a move from any of the players, the state is going to be returned to all of them. Now for our lobby, it will just be displaying the users and bots that are in the game. By default, all empty spots will be filled with bots. So if a player joins in, a bot will be replaced with him. Let's make our first player that joins the game to be our host. This way we can make him the one that decides to start the game. We can do it by adding a new field is master to our player state and check if we are the first user to ever join. Before starting the game, let's see what the game should actually do. In a trivia game, usually we have different parts of the game. This one is about taking tiles, so at the end of the game, whoever has most of them wins. When we start the game, every player will have the choice to pick any of the three tiles on the map. After that, the first stage of the game begins, where every round all the players select two empty tiles and answer a numerical question. After they do, the first player that answer is closest to the correct one will take two tiles to himself and the second one will take one tile. And the third takes nothing. This repeats until all the tiles are taken. Then the second stage begins where we're going to battle for any tile on the map. This is one-on-one -on -one battle where the questions are now with picking an answer, not numerical. If the attacking player has answered correctly and the enemy not, he takes the tile. Let's look at how this should work in our code. First, we have all the different phases. These are going to be sent to the players from the server to notify them what part of the game are they on. Because it's turn-based game, we create for every phase to be running for a certain amount of time, so it's not endless. For every phase, we will have moves that we send from the client to the server, so we define them as well. Now, here is the part that will be different depending on what kind of multiplayer solution you're using. Because we're making a round-based game, with timers, we usually need to run them on the server. And when the round ends, notifies every player. But your turn currently doesn't support that. From what I know, they will in the future. But even if you're using something different, let's see how we can solve this. To make our timers, that means we need to have them in our client site. But that means every client will have the same code with the same timer. So it will send multiple requests. And then the server will return to every player multiple states as well. To prevent that, it's actually very simple. We already have defined our master player, which is going to be exactly what we need. So we need to check if we're the host of the game. And if we are, we're the only ones that can send the timer requests. We can do the same check on the server side as well, just in case. If by any chance a move has been made by a player that is not the master, just send the state without changing it, or maybe throw an error. After we know all that, let's see how the start game works. First, changing the status to in-game and set the phase to pick starting tile. Even though the timers are going to be running visually in the client side, we calculate them from our server, which is done by just having the current time plus the duration of the phase. And because this is the first round and there is no answering, and just free pick of a tile, and we have bots in the game, we choose a random tile for them. On the client side, like we saw, Every time a new phase starts, we start the timer countdown. For displaying the actual time, I'm using countdown circle timer. Something I really like about your turn is how we can handle unwanted cases. Let's take for example choosing a starting tile. There might be a case where the one we chose is already picked or the player has chosen a tile already. No matter what the case is, on our server side we just need to throw new error and then we can catch that in our client side. And that's all we need. You will notice that I use that in a lot of places, as it is really clean way of just checking unwanted cases. When the first tile pick ends, we start the next phase of selecting tiles to battle for. Again, if we have bots, select random ones for them. To make the bot answers more interesting, I have added a bot range field from which I am calculating a random number between that range. You can do something similar for any kind of answers, not only numbers usually. Just put an array with possible answers and pick a random one from there. This way it's actually way more interesting than just a completely random number. Also, the smaller the pool of answers is, the smarter the bot is. Like I mentioned earlier, the winners are calculated based on how close they are to the answer. 
it takes into account how fast did they answer. When the board fills, we go to the next stage of attacking each other. Again, we have our rules for who we can attack. If the round ends and the player whose round it is has not attack anyone, a random enemy will be chosen. This is a must for a board game because we have to make sure that there is a move made. You cannot count on the player to always be on time, or maybe something went wrong with his connection, or whatever the case is. You can also see there is attack order on the bottom left. The way this is calculated is based on array we have with the player's order and the current round. Something important we need to take into consideration is when the round ends, is the next one valid or not? What I mean by that is, for example, if the current round is the last, then that means there is no next round, so it means we should end the game. But because the game is based on taking tiles, we can have a player which will have all the tiles for himself. Then this is another case, where the game should end before even reaching the last round. Another thing to consider is if the player that should attack next turn has any tiles. If that's not the case, we need to skip him and go to the turn after that. In my case, I have structured the turns in a way so there are no consecutive turns of the same player. But if you do, just make the check again and skip to the turn that there is a valid player to actually attack. For answering the questions with tick answer, I have done something similar to the numerical, but without the range part and also I have added 20% chance for the bot to choose the correct answer. Well guys, this is how I made a multiplayer trivia game with 3 players and bots. As any project, it can grow a lot more, but for now I am very happy with how it turned out. A game that you can enjoy with someone else, bots or both. I'm going to continue with the development for a second video at some point, but until then you can get the full code from the description and take ideas from there or just further develop the game yourself. Also all the links from the tools that I've used will be in the description plus a link to a full playable version in there as well. Here are some things to consider for further development. Currently the questions are being hard-coded in an array, so much better will be if we have a server to get them from. The UI and the design can be improved a lot by adding more to the environment and style of the components. In-game chat system might be a nice but also scary thing if we add it as well, because sometimes if you're creating a game that's like a trivia, you might want the players to not communicate between each other, just so they don't abuse that. But of course this depends on the game. And another thing is currently if we tie the answers nothing happens. But it will be interesting if we make it so, if we tie the answer, then another one appears, which will be a numerical one, and then we will have for sure a winner. Either be based on his answer or how fast he did answer. Again, these are only some ideas that you can implement yourself or when this series continues. Until then, you're more than welcome to ask any questions in the comments or give suggestions for what you would like to see in the future, like languages, just any ideas, projects, whatever it is. If you have enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate if you leave a like and subscribe, but even if you do not, thank you for watching and see you next time.